Live from the canyons of Vermont, it's amateur radio station K1GMM, where zip ties and duct tape are a man's best friend and cheese is always extra. Hey folks, how's it going? Steve here, K1GMM. We're going to go over ESSB audio and show you what's going on here in the shack. So first thing I'd like to say is once the video goes to YouTube, please keep your comments civil and respectful and courteous. This is a hot button issue with a lot of opinions. You know what they say about opinions, don't you? Yeah. yeah think toilet bowl, septic tank. There you go. And everybody's got one. Anything that I see that is discourteous or not helpful or just plain rude, I will delete. And if it persists, I will disable the comments on the video. This is a hot, like I said, a hot button topic. So anyways, uh, let's get right to it. What is ESSB audio? So ESSB audio stands for, ESSB stands for extended single sideband. Um, there's something that needs to be said. If you're going to run, let's say most modern transceivers with the exception of ICOM are capable of transmitting wider than 2.9 kilohertz wide. Um, to get true ESSB audio, to get the top end that you need, you need to be out at least three, I would say 3.3, excuse me, 3.3 to 4 kilohertz wide to get the real silky top end. So if you're going to run 4 kilohertz wide, please be courteous. Don't do it in a crowded section of the band. Do it somewhere where there's room on each side. And if someone says you're interfering with them and you're running 4.4 4 kilohertz wide, please move. Don't be a dink like I hear so many guys do. You know, either wind the band within for the time being or, you know, just be courteous. Uh, don't be an asshat. So you make a lot of more enemies than you make friends. I'm just saying that. And I've heard a lot of that on the, the guys that you'll hear that are really good choose a portion of the band where they won't interfere with anyone. So there you go. They're the good guys. Um, what's the difference between absolute and subjective when interpreting audio? Audio is mostly subjective. In other words, it's a personal thing. It's as personal as the underwear you wear, the deodorant you wear, the type of toothpaste you use. You use. There is an absolute involved though, and that it, it has to be legible, it has to be copyable. So keep that in mind when setting up your system. Um, I wanna discuss, this is a very important thing and this will plague many people. It plagued me and I'm anal retentive when it comes to this stuff. Um, the effects of RFI on outboard audio gear and the importance of isolation. So I'll go out to the left wide camera here. So what we have, you can see over here is the rack. It used to be over there, right next to the rig. And I didn't have a problem until I got on 160. I got on 160 and something to do with that wavelength. That gear does not like being anywhere near this equi the, the equipment. I swept it with a extremely sensitive field strength meter. I couldn't pick up anything, even with the app running. So as far as pulse back, RFI, stuff like that, common mode coming in the shack, it's not here. But it's something to do with the wavelength. So my advice would be to, if you're going to do this, Keep your rack gear away from your HF station and use top quality cables. Go ahead and spend the money on good cabling because what good is it if it doesn't work? If, if you use crap cables, you're wasting your time. So we're going to go right into signal routing, routing, however you want to say it, which is basically signal flow. How do you get the audio from your mouth to the radio? So I'll show you what this looks like. So if you look at this, uh, it goes from the microphone, the preamp, to the preamp. Now this microphone requires phantom power. So 
the preamp does have phantom power. So you have to be careful if you, if, if you use a dynamic microphone, any old preamp will do. But if you use any kind of microphone that requires 48 volt phantom power or anything like that, you will need a specific preamp. Most preamps come with phantom power at this point anyways. To the Ultrograph EQ from the preamp, to the 204 oral exciter, to the microverb. Now you're, at, you're probably thinking, why on earth would you need a reverb unit? Well, you want that just a little touch of ambient room uh, space on your audio. You know, you don't, when you stand there and talk to someone face to face, you're probably not doing it in a padded cell. But unfortunately, that's the way the audio comes across on HF. So to compensate for that, you can introduce a little, little, just a hint of reverb, just to give it a little bit of space, like it sounds like you're in a room. Okay. From there, we go to the Multigate Pro Expander Gate, and I use that strictly for the parametric uh, filters um, and the expander. And from there, it goes into the Composer Pro, which is a gate expander compressor limiter de-esser. And I use in the expander along with the gate on HF. The gate isn't running now. Uh, the compressor limiter, which is very important because what you're doing when you t do this and you feed the audio into the transceiver, you're basically taking a 900 horsepower twin supercharged engine and cramming it into a Volkswagen Beetle. And it usually doesn't end well if you, if, if you can't get things under control. So that piece of equipment helps a lot. And then from there, it goes uh, into the radio. So that's the signal flow. The next step, uh, the next step is the monitoring. How important is the monitoring system? So here you can see the monitor system I have, and you can do it any way you want. You can't appreciate it unless you have an adequate monitoring system. So what I use, I come out of the computer. You can do this coming out of the radio, but you'd have to get a line level out to do it out of the radio. I'm using SDR console and I monitor through that and that dumps to, I'll show you right at the very bottom of that rack is the Elisa Semi Q230. That is the EQ for the PA for the monitor system. Now from there, it goes into the TAC receiver right here, which is, I think, 100 to 150 watts, something like that. And then into a set of Sony cabinets, you can see. And they're on each side of me. One is in the base of the rack, and the other one's on the floor next to me on the right-hand side. And some of the guys running the Anons, like uh, KF2GG, KF2 Golf Golf, Richie. I swear to God, it's like I'm going to have to grab some spackle and some tape and retape the seams in the sheetrock because it'll literally crack the freaking sheetrock. I mean, it's, it's absolutely bodacious. So that's the importance to the monitor. You want to be able to hear it and, and appreciate it. Um, even if you're going to listen, uh, that would be worth doing. Legibility is an important thing. Un learn about where the human voice sits in the audio spectrum. Learn about, understand, you can't boost a frequency that isn't there to begin with. If you have a high squeaky voice, it, it, there's nothing you can do pretty much to get that bodacious bottom end. I have a very low voice, so it's it's easy for me to get that. So understand how it works in the audio spectrum. Uh, vocal presence, peak presence on the human voice as far as intellig intellig intelligibility goes is somewhere between 800 hertz and two kilohertz. That's what makes the human voice articulate and copyable. So be very careful ripping those frequencies out. Is it worth the trouble? 
is it worth the trouble? It's a purely individual thing. It's a totally individual thing. It's not for everybody. I like it. It's it's a to me it's a very important aspect of the hobby in the sense that anybody who talks on HF or on the radio you're using your voice to do it. Digital modes aside and CW. So audio to me is very important. So um and and the last question is is why why would you want to do that? Well, I wrote down some jotted down some thoughts here. So at the bottom you'll see uh this is more of a personality thing, but you need to be a tweaker. If you're not a tweaker, don't even venture into this realm because you're going to be tweaking this thing nonstop, pretty much on a daily basis. And that's the fun part of it. It's learning, experimenting, and that's what it's that's what this hobby is all about. So if you if people place boundaries on you, in other words, if you're copyable, first of all, if they don't understand that audio is subjective, walk the other way. Now, if they say you've got RFI on your audio or you're all mud and they can't copy you, well, that's a problem. You better wake up and listen. So um, that's what I mean. It's a hot button topic. It's a tough one. So it's not for the faint of heart. Um, probably one of the biggest things is it'll get, give you a better understanding of the capabilities and limitations of modern HF transceivers. What can you get out of them? How much can you put in and how much bang for the buck in return can you get? Um, understanding how this stuff works, I think is just as much a valuable aspect of the hobby as, as knowing how an antenna works. Because you could have a great antenna, but if your audio is total crap and people can't understand what you're saying, what good is it? You see my point? I know that's a little extreme, but... Um, you know, and finally, you know, it's fun. It's fun to do. It's fun to play with. No, it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone. And on average, a good old fist mic that came with a radio is plenty adequate. I'm not saying in any way that that is inadequate. I'm just talking about the whole other side of the hobby, which is ESSB. It's a whole different realm. It's very cool. Um, I'm learning a lot about it. So what I'm going to do now to close out is I'm going to play you a clip that I recorded through the 7300 this afternoon. And it's the audio that is actually going out of the transceiver when I'm on HF. It was looped from the monitor output of the 7300 back to the computer and recorded in the computer. So let me go ahead and key that for you. Here we go. Here is a demonstration of ESSB borderline ESSB audio of the ICOM IC7300. This is a direct output to the computer from the monitor function on the IC7300 and it is the audio being transmitted via RF uh, whenever the radio is keyed. Uh, this is not what I would call full ESSB audio, although the amount of audio that is passed through the audio chain in the transceiver is quite impressive. Uh, audio from approximately 50 to 60 hertz all the way to borderline 4 kilohertz, but it does lack, as you can tell, the transparency uh, necessary to bring it truly into the realm of the ESSB audio. Okay, okay, so um, as you can see, even at 2.9 kilohertz bandwidth, you can do a lot with the audio. So all is not lost if you can't go 4K wide. So I figured I'd just throw this out there and give you, give you guys something else to chew on, <laughs> as if there's not enough already. But there's so many different aspects of this hobby. You know, um, To some people it's important, others, who cares? And that's totally fine. Like I said, it's not for everyone. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll say 7-3. Have a good time in whatever you're doing. Remember, if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. 
So, and it's an individual thing. Everybody's different. And just to let you know, I am not monetized currently. I don't care if you subscribe, but if you want to know when a video is posted and you want to know when a live stream is coming or a live stream is happening, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and click the little bell icon and you'll be notified. Uh, thanks again. And we'll catch you soon, hopefully on the air. And you give me a, an ear full of that ESSB audio, 7-3.